Hi, I am Dr. Audrey Drummonds uh, with Interior Coverings Ministry. I welcome you uh, to this um, video that I'm doing right now uh, into my office right here. And as I'm studying the Word, I'd like to share a few things that have been on my heart. Uh, about a week, a couple weeks ago, I, I guess, I taught um, a series on women in ministry as well as uh, particularly Mary Magdalene, and I was blessed that someone actually recorded that teaching um, at the audience that I was teaching at. And so I shared that on Facebook, and in doing so, I was in awe of how many people, um, about 25,000 actually, around the world uh, in the Christian community told me they'd never heard any kind of a, a teaching like that. Later, I actually heard, uh, or not heard, but I saw on the History Channel the Jesus series, and when they talked about Mary Magdalene, I was in awe of how much of what they were sharing about Mary Magdalene is what the Holy Spirit had given to me just to teach on, but yet I had not heard that beforehand. So it was a double witness for me, and I thought, wow, how many people are watching the History Channel's uh, series on Jesus during the... Um, the uh, Easter season, Palm Sunday Easter season that we're at, and yet here we had Mary Magdalene right, right in the picture, called the first apostle, um, given the greatest story ever told, uh, that if we had not had her as, as uh, the forerunner, we would not even have the, the um, resurrection story today. We would not have that story because if you look at the scriptures closely, um, all of the, the male apostles feared and they ran away. The only one that stayed was John, but we don't have John's words uh, in, the, in the testimony until many, many years later of this particular story or any of John's writings actually. So from about around 33 AD that we, you know, estimate of when Jesus went to the cross and the resurrection, um, till about um, 90 AD when John does his writings, what's going on? That's, a, that's several generations in there that if we hadn't have heard it from Mary, who, who not only gave it to us in, in a double witness, she told us that she heard um, that he had risen, which is where most of us are at. But then she went back after John and Peter went to the tomb to look for themselves. And then she went back to the disciples and she said, I have seen the resurrection of the Lord. I have seen him. What does that look like? What, what have, have y'all seen the resurrection of the Lord? Have you seen him today? What does the resurrection of the Lord look like? See, this is where many of us, after almost 2,000 years later, are still looking for um, Jesus from an artist's uh, picture of what was in an artist's mind, that we have our, our pictures on the walls, um, that he's going to just come out of the clouds. Um, you know, hope, hope uh, we'll recognize what cloud he's on, and I say that in, in pun, considering how many pictures are now and photos and information is put on the clouds uh, with our technology. But in reality, when we consider that we have this imagery of the return of the Lord, that Jesus coming is coming in a cloud, um, and he's going to look like the Jesus that we've portrayed through our media system, you know, whether through photography, through artistry, yet if you um, just Google uh, the what does Jesus look like, and you're going to come up with thousands of pictures. And it's like a game that says, will the real Jesus stand up? So I say that is that there's one thing of the man, Jesus of Nazareth, that uh, people knew before the cross. But after the cross, what did the resurrection Jesus look like? Who was he? Was he really this, this image that we have on our media and our, and our movies and, and he's all dressed up in white and he's not you know, covered with blood and he's, he's um, looking pretty sharp. 
and stuff? Or is there something more? Is there something more that we're missing because we're looking in the wrong direction? You see, a key factor that Mary um, showed us is that she was looking for the Lord's body. And Jesus told the disciples at the, at the last Passover that he celebrated with them, this is my body. This is my blood. So after the resurrection, where are we supposed to find the body of Christ? That the blood of Christ is flowing through? That's a key. Because on one hand, we're referring to the church as being the body of Christ. But on the other hand, we're so disconnected with our denominations and our, and our theology that we don't know how to discern the Lord's body. And that's where Paul went and he said in 1 Corinthians that because we don't know how to discern the Lord's body, we still have sickness and dis-ease among us. That's what we have today, even death. Not death in essence of our flesh, but death in the way that we think because we're thinking from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of life. The tree of knowledge is that tree that Jesus hung on. That is the cross. But when we keep raising the cross as a higher standard than the resurrection, we diminish and we void what Jesus has done. And we, he's, okay, I'll just wait for the next generation to come. Well, guess what? That's this generation. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ that said, the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what Jesus said. He said, go tell the people, go tell them. This is found in Matthew. The kingdom of God is at hand. Prepare ye the way is what John said, John the Baptist. And he even said, because the kingdom of God is at hand. It's not someday when you die that you go to heaven, but that you now have the authority and the power to bring heaven into your realm when you are connected to what Jesus is doing and what he did because you become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And the question is, do you believe? What was the journey that Mary didn't have to experience because she not only heard of the resurrection on, on resurrection morning, as many of us do, as I just said, but she saw him. She didn't have to do a key factor that all the other disciples had to do. And that key factor is she didn't have to go to the Galilee. All of them are in Jerusalem. They're all in fearfulness during the, the Passover uh, unleavened bread, first fruit season. It was customary in the traditions of the Old Testament that they needed to be in Jerusalem. It was also tradition that because they needed to also be for uh, the Lord's next major feast, which was uh, Shavuot, um, uh, uh, or, or what we call as Pentecost. I'm, I'm not sure I'm saying that right. Um, that they had to be in Jerusalem again. <laughs> but between the first fruit and the Pentecost, which we know from the church perspective that that's when they, the disciples received the Holy Spirit, there's a 50-day journey. This 50-day journey, God endorsed it as, uh, through Moses, as the Feast of Weeks. It's not that you have to do it, but you get to do it. And it is the Feast of Weeks that is the free will offering. So in our Christian realm, when we say we have God's divine plan, but then we have our plan of free will. You don't have to, but you get to. So what is all that about? It's not about Passover, and it's not about Pentecost, and it's not about Tabernacles, which is the third fall feast, major uh, feast that we'll talk about uh, at another time. What I want to, uh, the understanding is they had to go to Jerusalem on those three major feasts, Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. But going from Passover, first fruits, which is that season right there of Passover, to Pentecost, it was a 50 day journey called Counting the Omer. And it was that that the scriptures tell us that 
You will be blessed if you count the Omer, but you don't have to. This is your free will. This is your choice. So basically, here's this, here's this um, the, what I want you to think about. Jesus died once and for all. How big is your all? That's that Passover season. So if we see the fact of all of humanity, that all of what the first Adam um, brought into the world of sin and death, the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, um, Paul refers to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it gave us a quickening spirit of the Holy Spirit. And he gave it, gave it in order for us to be able to do the transformation from the old man into the new man because of what the Holy Spirit um, imparts into us. It's a quickening of our spirit is the way the scriptures refer to it as. But we don't have to. Here's a here's a uh, illustration that's I like to say. You may have not known your natural parents. For some reason, they weren't part of your life in growing up. Um, uh, however, the fact that you're here says you have biological natural parents. In today's information age. You can just continue and say, well, I know I'm alive and I've got my natural parents. But we now have the understanding of a way of doing DNA testing, of researching through our, our computer systems, of finding out who that might be. You don't have to find out. You may not really want to know. But it's a free will that you can if you want to. The free will offering of counting the Omer is going to have a positive effect. The information of finding your natural parents, it might not have a positive effect. But the free will offering that God has is showing you that he's not only God, he's your heavenly father. And that when you count the omer of an awakening of, of resurrection life and what that looks like, that the word becomes flesh within you. The word <laughs> becomes flesh within you. Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. The word becomes flesh. Jesus appeared to over 500 people during that counting of the Omer. Paul talks about this and yet in counting the Omer on Pentecost, we only have 120 in the upper room. Yet he appeared. He appeared. Something is happening that he is appearing to us every single day. But we don't know it because we're looking for another Jesus. We're looking for, for Jesus of... Um, that walked on the on the water, or Jesus that walked on the earth and healed the blind man, or um, healed the deaf. We're looking for the Jesus that walked all through the lands of Israel, and yet God is going with us. He's tabernacling with us because it's Christ in you. That's the hope of glory. That there's only one Spirit. There's one Father. There's one Christ. <laughs> There's one body, and Jesus Christ is the head of that body. And he's looking to, to return in the unveiling that it's Christ in us, but now are we living a life to where spirit life, that Christ, the Christ in us, we are now in him, and we are now moving and having our life in him. So when other people see us, they are seeing the living epistle of Christ Jesus working through us. What does that look like? It looks like the tree of life, not the tree of knowledge that says you're a good person or you're a bad person. If you do this, God will love you, or if you do that, God's going to send you to hell. That's, the, that's not the body of Jesus Christ. So I, I encourage you today, rethink the resurrection. Get to know Jesus as Lord and Savior 
one letter at a time, one Hebrew letter at a time, one Greek letter at a time. As you take this journey of counting the Elmer uh, to unveil what the Word says, one of the greatest uh, temptations that Jesus was confronted with by the enemy of God was to turn the stone into bread. Jesus was hungry. But Jesus stopped and he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know what every word is? That means the entire Bible. And it's written for you and only you. So if there's scriptures in there and you say, oh, that doesn't apply to me because I'm a man and that's talking about a woman. Or uh, I'm a woman and that talks about a man. Or, oh, that's about a slave. I'm not a slave and stuff. You are making your own theology. It's like taking certain things out of the Bible and saying, oh, God, I don't need that because that's not really me. And he's saying, no, you do need it. And you're missing the point. Because it's not about pointing fingers at other people. It's about the unveiling of the love of God in you. That you're, you're pointing despite the difference, despite the race, despite the gender, despite the economics, despite the politics. None of that matters. You elevate yourself higher because you're bringing the kingdom of God into this world to rule and reign just the way Jesus did so that we can start manifesting the greater works how many of y'all out there want to start raising the dead? How many of y'all want to start seeing, seeing the deaf uh, being able to hear just by you praying and you putting your hands on them? How many of y'all want to see that you put, put your hands over a blind person and they see? Or you touch somebody's body and they're healed? That's the kind of message that we want to do. Not just healing the body, but healing the soul with the goodness of the kingdom of God that's now here. If you like this kind of video, I'll be more than happy to keep doing them. I am not techie at all, and I could really use some help on any of that. Um, so uh, send me a message and let me know. And in the meantime, I will do my best. I know that I am so full of the word. I study it constantly, um, walking and talking, and people ask me constantly of, of these messages is, how do you get that, Audrey? How do you get, get it? And I want to give it away. I want to show you in the Word. Right now, what I'm talking about uh, is found in Deuteronomy 16.9, uh, in the weeks for, of Daniel, uh, chapter 9, also in Exodus, uh, chapters 23 and 34, Numbers 28. So do that research, and uh, I will hopefully get back to you really soon with more videos and God bless you. Bye-bye.